Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Russell Nord. Dr. Nord is a fellowship-trained orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports medicine. He treats a variety of conditions in both the athlete and the non-athlete. Dr. Nord completed his sports medicine fellowship at Stanford University where he took care of Stanford athletes and served as the team physician for the Stanford football team. He also provided orthopedic care for the San Francisco 49ers. Prior to joining Stanford, Dr. Nord completed his orthopedic surgery residency at NYU Hospital for Joint Disease in New York City, where he was selected Executive Chief Resident during his final year. Dr. Nord received his Doctorate of Medicine at Cornell University and completed his undergraduate work at Duke University. Dr. Nord currently serves as the Medical Director for Washington Sports Medicine. Why does my shoulder hurt? It's a question that I think people sometimes ask themselves, and the old joke would be, raise your hand if your shoulder's hurting, but of course we don't want to make you do that if that's the case. So the basic concept with this talk is, obviously in any specific case, to understand why someone's shoulder is hurting, you need to be seen by the doctor and get a good history, a story of what's going on, and get the shoulder examined. In most cases have x-rays, in many cases have advanced imaging like an MRI or a CAT scan done. But if you're looking with broad sh or looking for just broad strokes of what sorts of things cause shoulder pain at different points in life, we can make some generalizations. So what we're going to do tonight is basically take a trip through time from childhood and adolescence through, through older age with stops in between to talk about different phases of life and what could be affecting the shoulder at those times and then the conditions of concern at those times. So, We'll start off by talking about little league shoulder and general overuse injuries of the shoulder, which are common in youth athletes, especially baseball pitchers. We'll talk about some multidirectional instability, or MDI, loose shoulders, and then frank shoulder dislocations, which is something that happens you know, in the younger population mostly as well. And then we'll talk about frozen shoulder, which can occur in more middle-aged patients, some AC joint pain, or pain where uh, people would have some pain at the end of their collarbone. And then we'll talk about the rotator cuff and the biceps. These are very common causes of shoulder pain. And we'll end with a talk about actual arthritis of the shoulder. Sometimes this arthritis comes as a result of having a large rotator cuff tear that hadn't been treated before. And sometimes the arthritis just comes in and of itself. And while knee and hip arthritis are things that people hear more about, shoulder arthritis occurs as well. So without further ado, let's do it. Shoulder pain is pretty common. As an orthopedic surgeon doing sports medicine, it's one of the most common body parts that we see patients uh, complaining of. Overall, about 16% of all musculoskeletal complaints involve the shoulder, and there are 50 new episodes per thousand patients seen in a primary care setting when we're talking about episodes of, of shoulder pain. Overall, you only have about a 30% chance of getting through life without having shoulder pain, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen to most of us. And the cost to society for this shoulder pain, the disability as a result of it, are quite great, as you see. So it's hard to talk about shoulder pain and teach anything about it without talking about the anatomy. And one of the things we're going to go through now is that when you talk about the anatomy of a body part, when it deals with the musculoskeletal system, you, you can look at it in different layers. So looking as deep as we can go to the bones here, you see that the shoulder is a ball and socket joint. But of course, this has a little cartoon in it. It has a pretend golf tee and a golf ball. 
because the ball and socket of the shoulder is very unconstrained, meaning that the cup is very shallow. It's not very deep. The hip is the opposite example. The hip has a very deep socket. People hardly ever dislocate their hips. They can, it can happen, but it's less common in shoulder dislocations. But people can move their shoulders much more than they can move their hip. You can hardly even move your hip back at all, but your shoulder can go almost every direction. So we see that here, and that's going to be relevant when we talk about the different things that affect the shoulders. So when you come out a bit more, and the bones are underneath all these ligaments here, you see what keeps the shoulder together. If we just had some skin and a couple bones underneath, well, we, we'd walk to the left and our arm would still be hanging out on the right. You know, we need some, something holding us together. And these are the ligaments and capsule, capsular components of the shoulder. When people dislocate their shoulder, this IGHL that we see here is typically what gets ruptured. But all of these are important, and if they're too loose, the shoulder can be unstable, and if they're too tight, the shoulder can be what we call frozen. So we'll be hearing about that again. Just for fun here, you see that the socket beneath here is attached to the shoulder blade. That's an important thing to think about as well, because oftentimes people get pain in their back, they'll say, kind of the trapezial area. But really it's coming from the shoulder, but then the shoulder's off kilter, and the socket's out of position, and then the shoulder blade's out of position, and then the muscles around the shoulder blade in the back start to hurt. It can also go the other way around, where someone has some spasm in their trapezial muscle, maybe coming from their neck, and that attaches to their shoulder blade too, and then that affects their socket of the shoulder and the dynamics of the shoulder joint. So if we peel those ligaments away, cut them, and look inside, what we see is here. Here's the socket, here's the ball, here are the ligaments cut. What I wanted to show you here is that the socket isn't totally flat, it has a little curve to it, and there's a little cartilage ring around it called the labrum. And the labrum is something that can be injured, uh, and it's something that we'll talk about a little later in the talk. Also, one of the two biceps tendons that we have attaches right at the top of the shoulder joint as well. So these are all things just to know as we're kind of going through the talk. We don't expect you to remember all of them, but when you see them again, it won't be so unfamiliar. Now, of course, that's not it. We don't have shoulder capsule and then skin. Something has to move this shoulder, so we have a number of muscles. And kind of the deeper layer of these muscles are called the rotator cuff. Most people have heard of the, of the rotator cuff, and that's because it's a very commonly injured region of the shoulder. And the rotator cuff is made of four muscles here, the supraspinatus up top, the infraspinatus just below, the teres minor, which we really hardly ever see patients complaining of, and the subscapularis, which is a very important and strong muscle in the front of the shoulder. So those are the four rotator cuff muscles. And then beyond the rotator cuff, you have all the other muscles of the shoulder. We already talked about the trapezius muscle, this large fan-shaped muscle that we see here. We also have the deltoid muscle and then all the other muscles of the back and the arm. So all those things can be contributing to the shoulder and any pain there. So here's our little pathway that we'll take today. And we're going to be going on a little train through time. And we're about to make our first stop here uh, in Little League shoulder and overuse injuries. So basically what Little League shoulder is, is a repetitive stress injury to the growth plate of the proximal humerus, meaning where the bone is growing at the top of a youngster's arm. Bones are hard but can be injured. Growth plates or cartilage kind of rings or slices, if you will, within a bone, and they're weaker, and they represent a weak link, and uh, they predispose children to, to overuse injury. When we look at who gets little league shoulder, because of the propensity, uh, for, uh, because of the uh, preponderance of the patients being baseball pitchers, we find that most of the patients are male. They also tend to be young because the growth plates have to be open, and there isn't really one moment when the injury occurs. It happens over time. What that means is that it's completely preventable. If we had different social strategies in how much to allow children to play, how to monitor their throwing, this really could be prevented. So there's been a large groundswell in the sports medicine community over the last number of years now to really get the word out about this. There's been a lot of positive progress made. So here's an example of this. These are x-rays of the right and left shoulder of someone who has a normal growth plate of their proximal humerus. It's supposed to look like this in a youngster, that's fine. But you look here and it's actually wider. 
it's, it's really like having a, a fracture through the growth plate, really, this little leak shoulder. There's no surprise that it would hurt so much. And why is that happening? Well, when you look at how a baseball player throws, and this is the first girl to get a win and pitch a shutout in a Little League World Series game. She has a 70, 70 mile an hour fastball. When you look at how she achieves that speed, this is Monet, that's her name, you can see how the arm comes all the way back so it can get that springing effect and recoil forward with all that energy. When you're doing that, you're twisting through that humerus bone. And if you're twisting that bone, it's not going to be the bony part of it that has the trouble. It's going to be that weak growth plate up top. And that happens time and time and time again without enough rest for the body to cool down. What eventually happens is they get a little weak shoulder, the arm breaks. The best analogy I can find for this is if you ask somebody how to break a paper clip. If you gave them three seconds to do it, you really couldn't unless you had a pair of heavy scissors with you. But if you gave someone a minute or two, they'd say no problem. We all know what we would do. we just start bending it. No big deal. Give it some time. Give it some time and eventually it's curtains. The, the paper clip just falls apart in our hands. And that's really how, how our body is working as well with the one difference that our body has the capacity to repair itself. But if you don't give it the time to repair itself, then it starts to act like the paper clip. So with all that in mind, a lot of this is going to be obvious to you. If someone has a little league shoulder and they come to our office, what do we do with them? We have them rest. Maybe they do a little physical therapy to strengthen, but they certainly shouldn't be throwing uh, while they're healing. It takes a long time. This isn't something where we say, oh yeah, take a couple weeks off and you'll be back, you'll be fine. The average time it took for one of these players to get back and pitch successfully without their pain was over four months. That's a long time. For a 13-year-old, that literally feels like a lifetime. They're going to be off that team for a whole season. The other players will have progressed. They will feel out of the loop. It's really difficult. And if they had just pitched a little less, they would not have had to take that large amount of time off. So it's about marshalling, uh, basically monitoring your resources and using, using your pitches effectively and not, not pitching too much. So when we do this, when players do come back, a lot of them don't even actually pitch anymore because they're worried about having this, this injury again. But even after this rest in some folks, pain will come back. So as I alluded to before, there's been a lot of thought in how to minimize this from happening. And so we came up, we being the sports medicine community, not myself here, came up with recommended pitch counts. And this is, is, this, this is adhered to by Little League now. And they take count and they make sure that young athletes aren't pitching too much without enough rest. The challenges we have is that, is that if you have a player that plays on multiple teams, one coach is keeping track of it, another coach is keeping track of it, but no one's really aggregating all of those pitches. So the child is at risk of going over. So you can see here that if you have someone that's up to 14 years of age and they pitch even just 21 pitches, they can't pitch the next day. They need a day of rest. And if they pitch 66 pitches, that's four days of rest. That would be more like a full game situation. So you, these, these folks can't be thrown every day. And you want to avoid other throw-heavy positions like catcher. You don't want to do that in your off day and be throwing back to the mound after every pitch. Uh, that, that, while technically not pitching, essentially does the same thing. This is just a blown-up version of it here. Now, it's not just the number of pitches that are thrown. There's a lot of belief that the type of pitch uh, may play a role. Younger players really just learn the fastball initially. Then you start getting to change up and more breaking pitches. But the idea is that things like curveballs and knuckleballs, sliders, screwballs, those breaking pitches, you really shouldn't be doing those until you're old enough to shave, until you're for a guy about you know, 14 years old or so. This is not <laughs> definitively supported in science, but it's pretty well accepted. Most, most folks are pretty much abiding by by these, these recommendations. So if you have a young athlete and they're playing baseball, they're a thrower, and they're complaining of a little pain in their arm or their elbow or their shoulder, it's not a time to tough it out. It's a time to be thankful that your body's giving you an early warning that there's something going on because if you take the rest, let the arm recuperate at the first sign of overuse injury, the recovery is going to be a lot shorter and a lot more effective than if you ignore it barrel through it, tough it out, and go until you end up with an x-ray that looked like that unfortunate youngsters where the, the bones were coming apart. So it's that old adage, an ounce of prevention, we all know what that's worth. And 
That's what we're trying to do in sports medicine here. So let's keep trucking along. Next stop, instability and dislocation. Now, you can get a dislocated shoulder at any age. It, it doesn't discriminate, but there are more common ages for getting it. When we talk about shoulders dislocating, there's really two subcategories I'd want to talk about. The first one is the true dislocation. When you have an injury, like this guy is having at the moment, you see he's not happy, and one minute you are fine, the next minute you are not at all. That's the classic shoulder dislocation. Then you have the folks whose shoulders are just really loose and kind of pop in and out, but when their shoulder dislocates, it usually doesn't take an emergency room doctor to put it back in, and maybe they can even pop them out at fun for parties and put it back in, which for the record I don't recommend doing. But there's some people that are more flexible than others. Uh, it doesn't matter how much I ever practiced. I could never do this. That would not, that would not go well. I can barely touch my knees when I, when I try to touch the floor. I'm just not flexible. These people that are elite gymnasts, dancers, ballerinas, what, what have you, they have looser collagen. They're able to do these sorts of things. There are certain sports where that's a huge advantage. There are other sports where it's a disadvantage. It's very helpful in swimming. So swimmers are, are one of the athlete groups that we worry about the sort of over um, kind of flexible shoulder pain type situation occurring in. So there we go. Some folks tear it loose and some folks are just born with it loose. So this is how someone looks if they've had a shoulder dislocation. You can see a normal shoulder over here and this guy's clearly out of whack. The ball's going to be out of the socket when you take an x-ray. It's going to look like this. This ball is supposed to be up there. It's not. We have a problem. And you see it down here as well in the cartoon. When that happens, like I said, you tear through your capsule and your labrum. Well, here it comes. Here's the socket. Here's the little labrum on the edge there. And that's torn off. You can see that here on what's called an MR arthrogram. This is a nice labrum in the back of the shoulder. No white line going through it. But this labrum's floating off here. And this person had a shoulder dislocation, most likely that tore it off. So if someone has a shoulder dislocation for the first time, unless they're very, very young, usually we'll treat them without surgery, keep them in a sling for three to four weeks. And if you're older, this works very well. So for me, as I'm pushing 40 here, if I dislocated my shoulder, I got treated in a sling, there's a 94% chance that I'd never dislocate my shoulder again. My joints are a little stiffer, they're less prone to popping out again, and I'm not doing the crazy things that say, uh, 15-year-old are either, so much less risky environment for an injured shoulder you know, to be in my body than a 15-year-old. But once you get under 20 years old, then you see folks that have about a 60, 70 percent chance of dislocating their shoulder again. So at a young enough age, we talk about whether it's worth doing a surgery to prevent a shoulder dislocation even after the first, the first time a shoulder pops out. So this shows that torn labrum over here, and we can do arthroscopic surgery now where we put a camera inside the shoulder all through small incisions and you anchor that labrum down to bone and use some sutures to snug it down there after getting this to heal together by getting all the old scar out of it and getting it nice and fresh and bleeding and this works very well. It's not 100 percent effective, it does have a failure rate but this is a lot better than the 60 something percent failure rate of no surgery in those younger, younger uh, age groups. So this is actually a case I just did a week or two ago. This is a 15-year-old varsity water polo player, and she had dislocated her shoulder. And she came to my office, and she'd actually tried kind of rehabbing it on her own a little bit before coming to the doctor, because I think she knew what the doctor was going to say. She didn't want to hear it. So unfortunately for her, her shoulder wasn't feeling so hot even after she tried to rehab it. So when we got inside her shoulder, we saw that there's really no labrum here. There's just the ball up here, the socket down there, and this is just a little wisp of what it used to be. So here's the edge of the socket now, and we're able to rebuild a labrum there. There's some of the stitches you actually see kind of puckering down at certain points and the knots and such over there, but she should do much better uh, now having that shoulder stabilized. She's doing nicely. Then there's the other breed of this, the multidirectional instability, the MDI, the ones that are born loose, just kind of loosey-goosey. And there's really no trauma here. This goes on in the teens and the 20s. Uh, the shoulder just starts aching. The swimmer or the athlete just can't quite do what they used to do. They don't know why. It's almost like one of the little league shoulders coming up. It just starts to hurt more. There's no real reason. 
And it's just, once again, kind of an overuse thing. You're, you're stretching this arm out too much or doing too many, too many reps of whatever it is, but maybe you're not spending enough time doing other strengthening exercises to provide support. Because remember, if the ball and socket and the ligaments are loose, we can help that still by having strength outside of that. We have these different layers of muscle. So if we're a little weak here, spend some time strengthening those other muscles to provide the support that the shoulder joint ultimately needs. So when we talk about people who are you know, flexible, some folks you can touch their palms to the floor. Uh, one of my favorite tests for it is to look to see if you can touch your thumb back to your forearm. I cannot, and that's normal. I see patients not infrequently in the office where they, they touch their forearm very easily there. So that doesn't mean you're going to have a problem, but it means you're slightly predisposed to it. So these are some pictures of some swimmers and some, some gymnasts or dancers. And you look at this one, and yet you wonder whether the head is spun around or whether the arms are doing something funny, but it doesn't look like a human supposed to be set up like that. But yeah, they've got their shoulders out in front. This is an Olympic swimmer from 2004 in Athens. This is a very famous swimmer. This is Michael Phelps, and you remember him before he goes on his swims. He does that thing where he leans over on the block and he's slapping his back and doing all that. And granted, Michael Phelps can do a lot of things that most of us cannot do, but that's one of them. Most of us can't really get our arms to curl around like that. And he's got the advantage of this, this flexibility as well as very long arms. And that helps him succeed, but he probably has to spend a lot of time strengthening to make sure he doesn't have any of these overuse injuries. So we'll call this a normal capsule, all right? Just enough flexibility that you can put your arm behind your back and do all things you need to do to scratch your back and wash your hair, but not so much that it's going to pop out. If it's a little lax, you got a little more play in it, that's when you get into trouble. So basically, what do we do? It's going to be interesting. You rest it, you strengthen it, you rest it, you rehab it, you rest it, you rehab it. That's what you do. But if that doesn't work, of course, there are surgeries for it where you can tighten the capsule up. But this isn't usually something we go to first line. This should respond well in most cases to a rehabilitative treatment. So if a patient comes in, we ask them to give us a little bit of time, rehab it. But if it's really not working out, there are good surgeries for this that can be done either open via a larger incision as shown here. But more commonly these days, this is all done through the, the arthroscope with the camera inside. You see that here, and it's very effective. About 85% of patients are able uh, to get back to their sport. So next stop, and this is kind of the opposite of having too loose a shoulder. This is the frozen shoulder and then the AC joint. So the AC joint, let's just talk about that really quickly. What is the AC joint? A is for acromion, C is for clavicle. Clavicle is the other name for collarbone. You see me highlighting that here. The end of the collarbone, as you go to the side, end somewhere and is next to something else. And that something else is called the acromion. It's a little curvy appendage off of your scapula. And so the little joint in between is called an AC joint. Okay? So if someone ever had a separated shoulder, you heard about that in the NFL, it's really not their ball and socket that's separated. That's no problem. It's, it's this. This is what a separated shoulder is. It's an AC separation. Okay? The collarbone we would say pops up from the shoulder. In reality, what happens is everything else falls down from the collarbone because some ligaments are, are torn here. And you see that here in this x-ray. This is a patient where they have an injury to this side. And if you look at the collarbones, they look like they're positioned relatively similarly to one another. But if you really spend a lot of time looking at shoulder x-rays, you'll see the socket here and the socket here. And we can measure off this little thing next to the sock called the coracoid, the distance between that and the collarbone. I drew some lines here. We don't have actual measurements to go with them, but you can see this one's probably about three times the size of this one. And once it gets to about twice the size, uh, if it's someone with a, any sort of demand on their shoulder, we we'll usually recommend fixing that, reconstructing that. And here's just a clinical photo of someone with a more severe case. It can be pretty, pretty pronounced. My technique is pretty similar to this one. I use a, a graft of actually hamstring from a, a donor and put that around that little tip, the coracoid, and I put it around the collarbone rather than drilling holes because I'm worried the, collar, the collarbone would break from that, um, and then suture that down, and then I have a little anchor that goes in the bone here with some stitches coming out through very small holes through the collarbone to give some initial stability 
And this works very, very well for folks. Uh, patients actually recover very quickly and, and do nicely and get back to their activities. So it's a nice, uh, a nice option to have. That's not the only thing that can go wrong in the AC joint. As you see down here, you can get arthritis. Here's a happy looking AC joint. Nice and clear, looks smooth, looks like it was drawn by a master artist. This one here looks like it's angry, it looks like a little rat was nibbling away at it or something, and it's got little bone spurs everywhere. That's AC joint arthritis. It happens mostly in overhead athletes and laborers. It's more of a middle age type problem. But just because you have an x-ray that looks like this doesn't mean you're going to actually have any pain. I see patients with x-rays like this all the time, and their pains from somewhere totally else in their shoulder. They're blissfully unaware they have AC joint arthritis, and that's fine. It's not dangerous. We leave it be unless it bothers them. But if it is bothering them, we can try to avoid the activities that cause the trouble, put a cortisone injection in it, or you can actually just trim off the end of the collarbone, which is a very straightforward procedure to do with an easy recovery. But we would try some non-operative treatment first. And there you see the collarbone removed, with that little gap, the little end of the collarbone. So you still have most of the collarbone. You just take off maybe a centimeter or so, and you still have all those ligaments there, so you don't end up having a separated shoulder. You don't go that far over. That would be a big problem. And the last little collarbone issue we'll talk about is distal clavicle osteolysis. This is really a melting away of the end of the collarbone. We're not exactly sure why it happens. What we are sure of is that it tends to happen mostly in weightlifters. And these are typically male, but they can be women as well. It can be from the 20s onward to the 40s or even later. And the treatment's exactly the same as the AC arthritis. Try to calm down with the activities, cortisone shot, trim off the end of the collarbone if that doesn't work. So. That's the kind of guy who's going to get this. And now, without, as, as promised, we have the opposite of the, the loose shoulder. We have frozen shoulder. Just a quick slide here. But remember, we looked at this cartoon before. We had the normal capsule, and then we had the two loose capsule. This one is just shrunk down. Just kind of shrinks down. You don't have any plane in it anymore. Can't get the arm behind your back. Can't reach overhead. And this is really kind of insidious. It, it comes on slowly. It can be very painful at first, very, very painful, and it's progressive, so it gets stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. And I have this here, the cooking of a frog. Like they say, if you put a frog in a slowly uh, heating uh, pot of water, it'll boil the frog. The frog won't even know because they don't get a sense of the big difference in the temperature. It just gradually gets them. That's what happens with frozen shoulder. Patients come in and they have this terrible shoulder motion. And I look at them and I'm like, whoa, this is really bad. you know. And, I don't say it, but I'm, I'm kind of thinking, I wonder what took them so long to come in. And, and they're reading between the lines, too. They know what I'm thinking. And, and they're saying, you know, it just, I think it just crept up on me. And that's what happens. You don't really notice it's happening until you have all this limited shoulder motion and you can barely get your arm on top of your head or barely back to your back pocket. Women, unfortunately, are more prone to this. And also, as if diabetics don't have enough things to worry about, they're also predisposed to this. I'd say, you know, I don't, I don't have the numbers, but in my practice, uh, it's got to be about half the patients with this condition have diabetes, but of course half the world does not have diabetes. So you see that, that increased uh, prevalence there. The x-rays and the MRIs are normal, but that's, they're still useful because you want to make sure this isn't really shoulder arthritis, just ground the shoulder to a, heart, a halt, but rather it's the, it's the frozen shoulder. So treatment, once again, you can do some stretching, physical therapy. You can do a cortisone injection in the shoulder, cortisone and steroid are the same thing. If that doesn't work, we can put the patient asleep and without making a decision, just break up the scar tissue and move the arm around. And if uh, that doesn't work, we can go into the shoulder from the inside and break up the scar tissue there, uh, once again, arthroscopically. But we usually give them about six months or so to get better on their own before we, we offer treatment like that. This a condition can improve on its own even up to two years out from the start, uh, but a lot of folks actually aren't really interested in waiting a full two years. So if we can make that a little quicker with a little intervention that's often appreciated. All right, this is probably the main event, even though we have shoulder arthritis after it, but rotator cuff tendonitis and tear. This is probably the most common shoulder condition class uh, that we see. And you guys are already experts in the rotator cuff. We saw a slide or two on that before. But just to reiterate, the rotator cuff is made up of four muscles and tendons. We didn't mention this before, but there is an overlying bursa, which is, say, sac of fluid, but really it's more like a, a web of, of kind of uh, connective tissue here. 
and that can be inflamed, causing a bursitis. So if someone ever had a shoulder bursitis, they probably were talking about that. It's called a subacromial bursa, because it's below the acromion, above the rotator cuff. The, the rotator cuff is very important for stabilizing and moving the shoulder joint, and this is a very common condition in the middle-aged as well as the elderly. You can see this. It's rare to see it in people in their 30s, less common in the 40s, but you, you can. But 40s through the end of life, this is going to be coming up. Just to get a little more anatomy under our belt, we reviewed the four muscles of the rotator cuff. You see them here. You see them here as well. This is an important view because this shows how they attach. This thing from the side of the shoulder. The rotator cuff muscles come from the middle of the body, and then they attach there. They're pinned down, kind of like stretching a tent out and tacking it down to the ground. Okay, and then they can hold that shoulder up. So when rotator cuffs tear, and you'll see this, what typically happens is they peel off from here and come back. They recoil back with that muscle toward the middle of the body. Here's a cadaver. This is a person who's passed away, and this is their rotator cuff. These artificial lines that are drawn there are showing where one rotator cuff muscle ends and another begins. You can see that while they're discrete muscles, if you go far enough to the middle of the body, they, they really kind of converge into a couple large tendons uh, uh, that are all shared when they attach. And you see that drawn out here as well where we have the different muscles and their attachment sites. So, how do we start to think that someone might have a rotator cuff problem? And how might, how might a patient come to realize that might be their problem? Even though the rotator cuff is up here, the pain that folks usually have is over here. It's oftentimes at night, they go to sleep and it hurts on the side of their arm. We think that's because when the rotator cuff's not working well, your deltoid muscle, which you see over here, has to work overtime and the deltoid attaches down here, so you get pain kind of over that overworked deltoid, kind of as a sign of the rotator cuff not being happy. And that could be because it's torn or just inflamed. You'll have pain and weakness with overhead reaching. Oftentimes reaching behind you can be difficult. You see this guy really having trouble raising the arm up and going behind. One of the reasons we think you get tendonitis, or patients get tendonitis in this, is from repetitive pinching under this acromion. All right, we've talked about acromion a couple times, and acromions can have nice flat shapes, more curved shapes, or more hooked shapes. And the rotator cuff sits in this space here. But if you have a large spur there, and you raise your arm overhead, you'll pinch that burst, you'll pinch that rotator cuff, and over time that can cause inflammation, and we even think that over time it causes tears. Initially, you might just start out with some of what we call tendinosis, which is really the newfangled term for what we used to call tendinitis because we found out there's actually less inflammation or itis there when we look at this tissue under a microscope. And then over time, you start getting some partial thickness tearing. We'd probably start on the top surface if it was from that bone spur. This is starting on the undersurface, which can happen for other reasons. And then it can progress to a full thickness tear, where it's like the tent stakes came up, the canvas is pulling back, and you've got a big hole between the ground and your tent now. And you could have your dog walk in without a problem. So what do we do about this? Well, if it's just tendonitis, we can start with a little rehab, try some anti-inflammatory medicines, cortisone injections. I do these virtually every day in my office. Um, that can help a lot. Here you see the acromion trimmed off on someone, so they have more space above their rotator cuff, which you see here. Okay, so you can trim off some of this bone, make a little more space. I think I'll be doing a few of those tomorrow. It's very, very common. And this is a picture showing some rotator cuff tears. And one of the key things to remember here is that rotator cuff tears can be very different. They could be partial thickness tears, they could be full thickness, and if they're full thickness, they could be huge, or they could be just a little spot that goes through all the way. Um, it's kind of like saying someone, if you got a rotate, that, that, that they have a rotator cuff tear, it's kind of like saying, yeah, I got, I got my car um, in an accident. Well, your car could be in an accident like this, which is nothing to, to sneeze at, or it could be in an accident like this, which is, uh, which is you know, that, that I think is, is probably tragic right there. So rotator cuff tears are, are, are kind of the same thing. You can have different grades of them, and the treatment is very different uh, based on the nature of the tear, the size of the tear, how long the tear has been there, because if the tear has been there long enough, 
you have a muscle that wasn't attached to any bone and therefore wasn't getting exercise and wasn't pulling on anything, and we have a muscle that doesn't pull on anything, does it stay as strong muscle or does it atrophy? It'll atrophy or turn to fat. And once that happens, actually, they can't be repaired nearly as well as before that's the case. So here's something showing a nice big spur off someone's acromion. It's a pretty unique one there. That could certainly be poking on that rotator cuff over time. This is something called calcific tendonitis, where you get some calcium deposit within the rotator cuff. Just an interesting thing to mention. Here's an MRI. This is slicing through someone like this. Okay. And here's the muscle of the rotator cuff from the middle of the body coming out to the side. It should be attaching here in the tent state. The tent's starting to pull up a little bit from the ground. But there's still some intact over here. It's supposed to be a partial thickness tear. Then you look over here, rotator cuff looking great, looking great, coming over here, coming over here, and whoop, hold on a sec, we have a, exactly, you got a whole hole there, that's a full thickness tear. So if I saw this in someone who was anything but, but very, very elderly, uh, I'd, I'd be recommending that we try to fix that, assuming that's where their, their trouble was coming from. So the interesting thing is that, and this was kind of what I was getting at in my last statement, a lot of people have some rotator cuff tears, but it's not actually causing their trouble. If you take 80-year-olds walking down the street with no shoulder pain, and granted you might have a tough time finding someone with no shoulder pain, but if you take 80-year-olds walking down the street that aren't really complaining of shoulder pain, half of them will have a full thickness tear of their rotator cuff. So, if someone walks into my office, they're 75, get a bunch of scans on them, it shows a full thickness rotator cuff tear, it doesn't mean that I can say, Eureka, we found it because they might have had that thing for years. Their spouse may have it. It's not bothering them. That's, that's kind of the art of medicine side of this, where you have to put the story together, the physical exam, which tests are going on, and someone's physical exam that are abnormal, what the MRI looks like, what the x-rays look like, to actually find out what abnormality is actually responsible for the patient's discomfort. Otherwise, you end up treating x-rays and MRIs and not people. And that's what we always have to be very vigilant to avoid. So we don't just use the imaging findings as the sole deciding factor. And although this looks like a, a, a something that needs to be put back, and it very well may be, we always have to look at the whole situation. And of course, we have to make sure there's not just symptoms coming from the neck or some other sort of source that are, that's masquerading as shoulder pain. Make sure we don't miss the boat on that. So in general, how are these repaired? Well, nowadays, they're mostly repaired through a scope with a camera inside the shoulder through small incisions. And you can see here you can put little anchors in the bone that have a lot of stitches coming out of them. And those stitches can be placed through this rotator cuff that is torn off. Here you see a big rotator cuff tear there. We see a lot of them like this in our office. And then you can tie these stitches down and get a, get a repair here. It's a very good surgery. It's very effective. Um, but uh, it's, uh, the healing process can take some time, uh, even six months or more, to get patients back to where they want to be, although plenty of patients are doing pretty well, actually, at the three- to four-month mark. And despite repairing these, actually, a lot of them will, uh, if you take repeat imaging on them, even though the patient's doing well, it may not fully heal when they look at the, these nationally and internationally. And they can re-tear or, or, or not fully heal in the first place, but the patients tend to do well even if they don't get complete repair. So here we'll look at a gal that I just saw. And you remember this view before of the cadaver shoulder. Her tear was sizable. I drew it out with a little cursor here. So her tear would be about like this, and we'll look at it now inside the shoulder. So this is inside her shoulder. And you see this little white guy going here? That's the edge of her rotator cuff. That's supposed to be all the way over here, so that's not good. She was an interesting case. She'd actually also broken her shoulder. This is her old fracture that healed right over there. But her socket's over here, so the tear goes all the way back there. And if I just pulled this and tried to get it over here, it wouldn't happen. It's not going to stretch that far. I could probably get to a stretch to about here. So what we do is we, we free up all the adhesions that it may have, and then we do something like this where we start to tie together from here to here and from here to here and from here to here, and you start to kind of zipper it up a little bit. 
And then you get it to the point where it's coming across here. You know, you've, you've mobilized it this way and move the tear closer to where it's supposed to go. And then you can put your anchors in, get all your stitches, have them coming through, and have it look like this. So this would be, you know, a before look. This would be part way through. We've got our zipper coming. There are a few stitches back here already. Now this isn't looking so bad. And then afterwards, we got nice tendon coverage here. Nice tendon coverage here. No more big hole. But she's got a lot of rehab ahead of her. A lot of rehab ahead of her. So, a little bonus topic here. Just, you know, because I know you guys are excited about the biceps tendon. And a lot of people have biceps tendon problems. I couldn't in good conscience give this talk without discussing the biceps tendon. So the biceps is so named because it has two heads on top. There's a long head and a short head. They attach down in the elbow as one structure, but at the shoulder they diverge and there are two attachments. Almost all of the shoulder biceps problems deal with this tendon, the little skinny guy, not the big meaty one. This is called the short head. This is called the long head. And this guy, it's just asking for trouble. When you have a tendon that's like a big piece of linguine going through a little uh, groove here, rubbing on the bone day in, day out for decade after decade with no meat on it to protect it, this is a recipe for disaster, like I said. And I see people all the time that have this as part of the pain going on in their shoulder. And while in medicine we often spend a lot of time looking for a single diagnosis to explain something, and that's usually the right way to go. When it comes with things in the shoulder, it's fairly common that someone might actually have a couple things that are working together to really make their shoulder uncomfortable. So we have to make sure we identify all of them, but at the same time, don't start treating things that really aren't contributing. So there's a lot of interesting diagnosis that goes into the shoulder. So here you see, it's thin, there's no muscle to protect it. Whereas the rotator cuff patient says, I have pain here. The bicep tendon patient says, I have pain here. And I see patients all the time that say, you know, I've had pain here for a while, but recently it's gotten really bad here. And I say, well, let's look at both of these things. Perhaps, perhaps they're both contributing. A lot of the tests overlap because it really is sitting right next to the rotator cuff. So it can be hard to discern sometimes, but we have, we have ways to, to tease it out. Now, how do we treat biceps tendonitis? This is going to be a common theme here. You could try some anti-inflammatory pills, some physical therapy, a cortisone injection, or you could do surgery. You could just release the tendon. You have two attachments. So you could release that short one, and you'll still have good biceps function. Good enough to win a Super Bowl. That's what John Elway had and Brett Favre had. John Elway's ruptured on his own, and they were debating whether to bother reattaching, and they decided that he really didn't need it to play quarterback, and they were right. He did quite well without it. Brett Favre was having pain from his biceps, and it wasn't rupturing on its own. The story you often hear, and this is what happened to Elway, his shoulder was really killing him. And then eventually his biceps ruptured, he felt great. And he left it, and the rest is history. He's done very well. Brett Favre was not so lucky. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't rupture on its own. So the, uh, the doc for the, the Packers, I believe, I guess, at the time, actually, I think he went out to Los Angeles for that surgery. They, they released the, the tendon surgically, which is a very straightforward thing to do. And he went on to the, the latter portion of his career having success as well. You don't need the biceps much to throw a football, but you do actually need to be in good shape. So it just goes to show how unless you're really in a specific line of work that requires maximal bicep strength, you can do quite well with the biceps released, and we don't have to reattach it. That said, there are downsides to releasing it. You can get what's called this Popeye muscle here. See the cosmetic difference? This can show up. There is a strength difference when you release the biceps. Not everyone who gets their biceps released gets this, but it is a risk, especially in thinner patients. Uh, so for a lot of our patients, we choose to reattach the biceps rather than just release it. But in a lot of patients, I just release it rather than reattach it. It depends. If we're reattaching the biceps, there are different sites we can use. But if they're having pain in this groove here, which is common, I'll typically go just below that, make a little incision, tack it down to the bone, sew it in there, the muscle down here doesn't know whether it's been attached here or whether it's attached up here. And all of this disease tissue can get tossed out and the biceps lives happily ever after with its new reattachment site. So, last stop on our train here. You guys have been very patient. We're doing, we're doing all right. 
shoulder arthritis, wear and tear. So shoulder arthritis, uh, arthritis in general is a, is a tremendous cause of physical disability in the U.S. Uh, 40 million people are affected. That's not shoulder arthritis, that's arthritis overall. And what arthritis means is loss of art articular or joint cartilage. So we saw some nice happy shoulder x-rays before. We had nice space and it looked all clean. This looks like that angry AC joint x-ray, but for the ball and socket. You got a big bone spur hanging down here that they call the goat's beard or a billy goat's beard. It looks like a billy goat's beard, big bone spur. There's no space. The bone's all white because it got hard because it's trying to deal with the stresses in the absence of cartilage, build up strength so it can tolerate the load. And this uh, looks more like a degenerative or osteoarthritis, which is the most common type of arthritis. You can also get rheumatoid arthritis uh, in the shoulder, anywhere else for that matter. And there's that special type of shoulder arthritis called cuff tear arthropathy, uh, which happens when the rotator cuff tears really badly. It no longer is serving its function to keep the head, the ball, down. The ball starts to rise up. It's no longer lined up with the socket, and that doesn't work well. It wears out. Okay, so here's a nice shoulder. Here's the beginnings of arthritis, and I wonder whether it's due to a rotator cuff. If you look here, the head's down and lines up nicely with the socket here. Nice little archway there, if you connect it. Here, uh-oh, that's a little higher up, so I'd be suspicious of this one. Maybe there's a rotator cuff thing going on at its beginning, and that You'd have to have slept through most of medical school to miss that one. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty serious there. That person would have very limited motion, most likely. Although every now and again, there's someone who surprises you. So with arthritis, you get pain, you get stiffness, you can get swelling. Oftentimes, it sounds like someone has a, a party involving Rice Krispies going on in their shoulder. They'll be moving around. There'll be snap, crackle, popping going on in there. Uh, they will have pain at night. And the x-ray will really help us tell whether this is just a bad frozen shoulder that won't move or whether it's a shoulder arthritis that won't move because the frozen shoulder x-ray looks great. The shoulder arthritis x-ray can look like a mess. So, not everyone with arthritis needs surgery, especially if they're very old when this first comes up. Maybe it's not too bad. Maybe we can buy them some good time. You can do some physical therapy. You can do all the things we talked about before anti-inflammatory, steroids, even lubrication injections in the shoulder. But when, you, when that's not enough, you can do shoulder replacements, just like you can do hip and knee replacements. And the concept here is you remove the diseased and inflamed bone and cartilage on the ball and the socket, and you replace it with artificial surfaces, just like we use metal and plastic, <laughs> excuse me, metal and plastic for hip and knee replacements. We use the same sorts of materials for shoulder replacements. And there are special ones that we can do for when the rotator cuff isn't working. Here's a cartoon showing a metal ball put on with the original ball cut off. A stem goes down. If anyone's seen a hip replacement, this is going to look pretty similar, but of course, specialized for the shoulder. The socket, it's a little golf tee. There's not a lot of room, so we can't have a big metal and plastic cup like we do for a hip, but a metal, uh, the little plastic one gets cemented in there and then the patient goes on enjoying their new artificial shoulder. The outcomes are very good with these. When someone has a rotator cuff tear, that surgery doesn't work. It wasn't obvious that it wouldn't, and I wouldn't expect it to be obvious to you, but they tried it many years ago, and they found out it didn't. The reason, after they looked at it, was that when the ball's not centered on the shoulder, the metal ball rides up on the plastic socket, and it's not being loaded in the center, and it eventually makes it act like a rocking horse and makes it get loose. And when the socket gets loose, the, the joint replacement becomes very painful and the patient's not happy and, and, uh, and something needs to be done about it. So they designed something called a reverse total shoulder that works better. And this looks like something, you know, out of, out of another, another planet. We've taken the thing that's supposed to have the ball on it and put the socket on it. And we've taken the thing that's supposed to have the socket and put the ball on it. The French came up with this. So, you know, they're, they're very, very smart folks over there, those French doctors. And the reason they, they think this works is that it allows your deltoid muscle to function better and be stronger, even if the rotator cuff isn't there. And it eliminates that little dinky cup 
that was getting loose from not having the rotator cuff, and instead you have this metal ball anchored with these huge screws here. And actually, oftentimes, we have bone grow into the back of it to give it even more, more stability. And it's a very good surgery. Of course, every surgery has risks, but it's a very good, very good surgery for people. So thank you very much for your attention. We, I know we went over an awful lot, but there's a lot that can go wrong with the shoulder. And believe it or not, I actually cut out some. So it could have been, it could have been even longer. But um, once again, thank you for your attention.